Well, we come now to the Word of God uh, to have some time of reflection upon the truths of Scripture. And if you're just joining us uh, for the first time, we have been in a series on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, we looked at the preamble, as it were, to the Lord's Prayer, or those verses that immediately follow, uh, preceded, about how not to pray. And then we looked at Jesus' instruction that begins at, uh, in Matthew 6, that we are to pray differently than the rest of the world might pray. And let me read for us what is said here in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read it in context so that you might hear the full weight of what it was that Jesus taught his disciples in this day. This is a, a prayer that was given or instruction given on prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, a, a sermon that's not meant for just anybody, but it's meant really for the disciples of Jesus, meant for those people who would be followers of Jesus. This is life in the kingdom of God the way it ought to be. This is how the people of God ought to live in this world. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples on how to live as disciples, how to be faithful followers of himself. And so he begins in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5 saying, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows that you need what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In a recent article on a blog page, Michael Kruger, who is a president of Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte and a professor of New Testament and early Christianity, uh, he explored this important question. How does a culture like ours that is committed to personal fulfillment, self-actualization, the dismissal of any truth claims outside of itself, a world where we create our own realities, our own right and wrong, and perhaps most importantly, our own meaning, how does a culture like that handle something like the coronavirus. He actually cited several examples of how people in recent days have handled the coronavirus. And one report tells us of a man who flies from New York to Florida knowing he had symptoms of the coronavirus. And while awaiting the results, he found out a test was positive after boarding a plane. And then he was banned from all future flights from that airline. Man who works for, a man who works for Dartmouth Medical Center had symptoms and was told to self-quarantine, but instead decided to go to a party with Dartmouth students, and later others were infected because of that. Then a man in Missouri was told to quarantine with symptoms, but instead he opted to take his daughter to the school dance. Then Kruger goes on to uh, note a more astounding action 
Perhaps the most disturbing of them all, he says, is the recent behavior of some college students over spring break. Knowing that young people are least affected by the virus, some students decided to party on, defying the orders to stay away from large crowds. And with a remarkable level, he says, of unawareness and disregard for the good of others, one spring breaker said these words, if I get corona, I get corona. At the end of the day, I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. partying. Whatever happens, happens. And Kruger then sums it all up by saying, in other words, the person was saying, I'm just going to do me and you do you. But we've also seen that this selfishness and cavalier disregard for others is not isolated to people who are willing to put others at risk. If you've tried to get a loaf of bread lately, or a package of meat, or hand sanitizer, and yes, even a roll of toilet paper, you've discovered that they're very hard to come by, if not altogether impossible to find in some places. As panic and fear have spread over the coronavirus, videos and photos show people greedily buying up far more than they could possibly need. They show no concern for the well-being of others, but only focus on themselves. If ever there was an example of the phrase, my will be done, it is expressed in so much of what we see happening in our culture right now. So how instructive it is, isn't it, then that for the church and for God's people to heed our Lord's instruction in this model prayer, particularly the instruction given in the third petition, which is this, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This this third petition of the Lord's Prayer, or as we said, it's perhaps more accurate to refer to it as the disciples' prayer, it falls neatly into place with the first two petitions. The, the first petition, as you heard earlier, is that we would desire and request for the name of God to be hallowed. We're to hallow God's name, but what does that mean? Well, it really means that we honor God's name, that we regard his name as holy. And as the name of God cannot be separated from the character of God, who he is in his essential being, what we're asking is, is that God would be revered. God would be regarded as holy. As one commentator puts it this way, God is to be thought of and spoken about and served with godly fear. He's to be set apart, not in the sense of being placed on a shelf and then ignored, but in this sense of being in the sense of being exalted above everything and everyone else. He is to be worshipped. Now the second petition. The second petition asks us to pray that our, heavenly, uh, that our Heavenly Father's kingdom would come. In one sense, we, we could say, well, well, hasn't the kingdom of God already come? You know, when Jesus began his public ministry, he declared that the kingdom of God was at hand. And he said, repent and believe the gospel. And when people saw that the sick were healed, diseases were cured, the lame were made to walk again, the deaf were made to hear, the eyes of the blind were made to see, and Jesus was casting out demons, he would say that this is evidence that the kingdom of God had now come upon them. And why is that? It's because Jesus the King, the Son of God, had come in the midst of his people and were here. God was among his people dwelling with them in the person of his son. But at the same time, at the same time we can acknowledge this and know this is true, there is also a not yet to the kingdom of God, a not yet to God's kingdom. It has not come yet in all of its fullness. As Christians, we live in the last days, the time between the first advent 
of Christ, which was his incarnation, and the second advent, which will be his second coming, his return. And when we pray for the kingdom of God to come, what we are praying for, as we saw last week, is that Christ would have ultimate triumph over Satan's control in this world, that the sin in our hearts, even as believers, would be more and more defeated. Derek Thomas makes it, uh, states it this way, when we pray this prayer in this regard, we are saying that we want every victory against sin and Satan to advance God's kingdom. And indeed, when, when we have victory in any area of our life over some besetting sin, or we get power so that it no longer betwixt us and holds us back, we are seeing more and more of the kingdom of our enemy, Satan, defeated, overrun, more and more the kingdom of God is expanding in the earth. But it's not only that, it's also that more and more people are being brought under the royal and reign of God in Christ as the gospel spreads throughout all the earth, as more and more people become Christians, the more and more the kingdom of God expands, the more Satan's territory is conquered. We are praying for also in the coming of the kingdom of God for the hastening of the glory of God's kingdom so that it can be said as in Revelation eleven fifteen describes at the end of the age, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And that's a day where all of the sin and the sorrows and the suffering of which we experience in this world will at last be put to rest, never more to plague us, never more for the people of God. So what are we asking now when we talk about the third petition, when we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Well, I think the guidance, one of the great guidance is given to us as the church. A helpful summary of this is found in the Shorter Catechism. Not that we're bound by the Shorter Catechism, of course, but the Shorter Catechism summarizes well what the scriptures uh, teach us. And it summarizes it this way, that in the third petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're praying is, is that God, by his grace, would make us able and willing to know, obey, and submit to his will in all things as the angels do in heaven. J.C. Ryle puts it this way, we're praying that God's laws may be obeyed by all men and women as perfectly, readily, and as unceasingly as they are by the angels in heaven. And that this is really the truest happiness for us is perfect submission to God's will. Our truest satisfaction, our truest delight in life can only be found in our lives being conformed more and more to the image of God, especially that which the image is reflected in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that is what we are to be conformed to, to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. God's people who are brought into union with him through Christ are being transformed and renewed, being changed such that we now reflect the kind of image that we were designed to reflect from the very beginning. You know, as all of us in this church know, that we have been called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We've been called to seek the glory of God above all things. As our First catechism question, what is the chief end of man? It is that we would glorify God and enjoy it forever. Indeed, it really is only in our, in, in, in our seeking the glory of God, our striving for the glory of God, that is indeed hallowing his name, seeking his kingdom, and of course pursuing our lives being more and more confirmed conform to his will as it is in heaven. That is how we come to enjoy the Lord forever. Our lives being more and more shaped by what we were created to be before the fall is that we would be like God and 
the way he designed us to be like him. And so that it would be seen in every dimension of our life that we are people who reflect our Father in heaven, indeed our elder brother also, our Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the things that's obvious, is it not, the reason why we must pray this prayer, we must pray for the will of God to be done on this earth is simply because it's not done on this earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever imagined what it's like in heaven? Even right now, even as I speak, even as we are gathered, some of us here, but most elsewhere, have you ever thought about what it's like even now for, for what the reality of heaven is like? What, what is it like in heaven? Well, it, it, is, it is the glory of God is championed and exalted at every moment. There's not a moment that passes in heaven that is not filled with the joy and the beauty of the holiness of God and the glory of God in every being in heaven. All the angels surrounding the throne, all the angels that do the bidding of our great God, always perfectly glorifying God, always doing that which he which is in conformity with his own will. There is no sadness. There is no sorrow there. There is perfect delight in the presence of God, a, a reverence of God. You probably can recall that image that you get in Isaiah chapter 6 of when, uh, the, when Isaiah is called up into the throne room of heaven in his vision. He, he sees the glory of and majesty of God filling the temple. Now he's on earth, but he has this vision, and one of the things that he then sees is the throne of God, and he sees these cherubim, these burning ones surrounding the throne, and, and they're worshiping God, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and, and with two wings, they cover their feet. Two wings, they cover their eyes. And with two wings, they fly. And when Isaiah sees that display of God, his majesty, and even how the angels revere him there, he, he falls down, doesn't he? And, and we're told there, he says, he says, woe is me. It's another way in Hebrew of saying, I'm being undone, I'm being pulled apart at the seams, I'm being torn asunder from the inside out. And as he sees the glory of God, he, he comes to the realization of his own unhol unholiness. He says, he says, you know, he, he, he's scared, he's going to die because he's seen this great majestic display of, of the holiness of God. And he's sure that his life is forfeit at that moment. And he says, he says, I am, uh, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then, of course, as you know, the story goes, as he tells what happened to him, an angel goes over and picks up a hot coal from the altar and places it upon his lips symbolically cleansing him, sanctifying him, making him a holy vessel of which then he can go out and proclaim the word of God, to proclaim what the will of God is to his people. That's what Isaiah was charged to do, to go into the world, to go to among his people, that is, and proclaim the truth of God to his people. And when he's asked, you know, who's going to go? Isaiah at that point is ready to say, I'll go. I'm ready to go. After he experienced the holiness of God, he had been awakened to his own sinfulness, but then he'd experienced the mercy of God, his grace. He then was brought to that place at which he now was in a position to serve and willing to serve, able to serve. And so when we pray, as we think about this passage here 
we pray that, that we desire the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, we want that vision of Isaiah and so there's other passages of the scriptures that describe what it's like for those in heaven. We, we desire for that reality to become the reality on earth. We desire that, that, the, that we would be able and willing to know and obey and submit to God's will in all things. So the first thing I would have us remember this morning is, is that when we are praying this prayer, we're first asking not for the world outside, we'll get to that, but what we're asking for is for God to change us, to, to make us people who are conformed to his own will and likeness. You know, I want to read to you a passage from uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, which I think very much summarizes what it is the will of God is for his people that we would be transformed to his likeness. And so Paul is writing these words, and he says it this way. He says, for this is the will of God for you, chapter 4, verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, which is another way of saying for our being set apart to be holy, to be made like Christ. So this is the will of God for us, first and foremost, is for our sanctification. And then he goes on to say, he gives some specific details of what that looks like. He says that, we, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. Sanctification looks a certain way, doesn't it? It looks like a specific type of purity. Of course, he highlights in this particular passage in 1 Thessalonians sexual immorality, of which we have no, uh, no, no, no want of in this day, do we? We have a world that is, is amassed in sexual immorality. But truly, folks, it's, it's nothing different, is it, than has always been. As it was in Paul's day, it was before his day, it was in the early centuries of the church, the Roman Empire was a cesspool of sexual immorality and all of its flavors, and it is that way today. But we, God's people, have been called out of that, haven't we? And we're called to a new lifestyle. We're called for our lives to be more and more conformed to the image of God. And this is why the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we are to pursue the will of God, that we are to be transformed, as it were, by the renewing of our minds. You see, this is the answer to, or the cure, as it were, to how we become more pe like the people that God is calling us to be, being able and willing to know and obey and submit to his will. We need his word to do that. We need to be in his word to instruct us to correct us, to guide us, to train us in how we ought to live our lives for his glory. You see, we cannot know God apart from the way in which he's revealed himself. We can't know the will of God apart from how he has explained and revealed his will. We, we sometimes, perhaps for many of us, and maybe you're like me, when I was a young man early on and I read, and when I was reading in preparation for this morning's sermon, I was coming across so many different authors who have had the same experience. But in my younger days as a Christian, one of the things that I was running into consistently was, or for me personally, was wondering, what is the will of God for my life? Maybe you've asked that question yourself. What is the will of God for my life? And what we were looking for was something very precise, weren't we? We were looking for God to tell us exactly what to do with our lives, how to do that with our lives. 
And initially, when I came down to Columbia Bible College many years ago, the purpose was to train to be a missionary because I thought that that was the will of God for my life, a missionary to a foreign country, to go to a place where the gospel needed to be proclaimed, where it was not. Well, of course, that was not the will of God for my life. And you know, I, I thought it was, but it wasn't. Turned out that God had different plans for my life. I think that we are misguided if we're at, in some ways when we're asking that question because God's word doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what to do. And, and in numerous ways, we numerous ways, we may not ever quite figure it out in, in some type of subject, subjective way. You know, what we really learn about what should I do with my life, how did I decide or find out that I might ought to be a pastor? Well, by God's grace, uh, it was through uh, just people in my life and a desire in my heart to be what I am today. And the affirmation and encouragement of fellow believers around me, that's kind of the ways in which God works in our life to lead us to know what he might have us do with our life. But really, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the will of God, praying the will of God be done here. What we're talking about is our lives being more and more conformed to the likeness of Christ. What we're talking about is that we will look like Jesus. Our lives would be holy lives. Our lives would be godly lives. Our lives would be setting forth the, the things of God above our own. And so when we, like Paul says in Romans chapter 12, which I started to mention earlier, that we are to be transformed. We're no, no longer to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, which comes through the word of God, in order that we may know what? What the will of God is. His good, perfect, and acceptable will. We can't know what God wants for our lives apart from that, apart from his word. And so that means we need to become diligent students of the Bible. And, and really, that is instructive, I think, even now, isn't it? Is when we see what's going on in the world around us. Now, how, how do we as Christians respond to this? How do Christians respond to the coronavirus? How should we live like Jesus in a time like this? Well, I think one answer to that is to see how Jesus dealt with difficult stuff too. You know, and one of the clearest places that we see the manifestation of Jesus' will seeking to be conformed to his Father's will is found in Luke chapter 22. And you'll remember that's where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he is arrested. And so we read there, uh, beginning at verse 39, these words, Coming out, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him, when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then, he, and then he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw away, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We see Jesus here in this passage saying to the Father, you know, if there's any other way, if all things being equal, as one commentator puts it, I, I would rather not have to go through this. I would, not, I would rather not do what you have sent me to do. You see, Jesus wasn't taken by surprise as to why he came into this world. He knew he had come into this world 
He had taken on human flesh to dwell among us for the very distinct purpose, as John tells us in his first letter, to destroy the works of the devil. But how was he to destroy the works of the devil? It, it was through him going to an awful death. Because, you see, he was offering himself up as a sacrifice on behalf of his people in order to save his people from their sins. And as we know, the scriptures teach us so clearly that apart from the shedding of blood, there, will, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus is described in the scriptures as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus knew when he came into this world that he was going to go and die on behalf of his people. He knew Isaiah 53 because Isaiah 53, the suffering servant described there, is him. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah. He knows what the Father is going to do. It was the will of God to crush him, is what Isaiah says of him. Jesus knows that this is going to happen. But yet, as he, as he comes to that faithful hour, he says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. If it were possible, but it wasn't possible. And Jesus was willing to submit himself to the will of the Father. And one of the things I think that's instructive here, not only is the example of Jesus' his commitment, we can, some people might say, well, you know, it was Jesus after all. Yeah, they can do the will. But I think if we said that, we would also miss the struggle that he was experiencing here, which is a struggle many of us experience, isn't it? To do the will of God. It's not always easy to follow God's commandments, to do what he asks us to do. It's painful. Why do you think that Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily? deny self and take up a cross. In the minds of the people who were hearing Jesus say that, when they heard that, they knew exactly what he was talking about. A cross? Why would you say that? Probably it didn't come clear to them what he was talking about until they saw what he did. He himself went to the cross. But, but, we, won't, but we need to see that Jesus was struggling here. In, in his human nature, he is struggling with the prospect of what he is going to go through. And not only that, something more may be going on here too. Just the very thought of the broken fellowship that the Father and the Son had had for all eternity. That in that moment, as he bore our sins on the cross, never ceasing to be the divine Son of God at the same time, he was experiencing something he had never experienced. In all eternity past, he had never experienced the displeasure of his father. That's what it meant for him to take the sin of his people upon himself. And he's willing to do this. And even it says here in Luke chapter 22, that even as he prayed, asking for strength, and then an angel comes. I mean, he's asking for, that he's willing to do what the Father commands him to do. He shows his disposition of his heart to do that. But uh, then the angel comes from heaven and strengthens him. And then it tells us that even after that, he's still in agony. In fact, the scriptures describe it, that he prayed very earnestly. We know that he prayed this prayer three times. Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There was great agony here. He sweat great drops of blood. So stressful was it. That this, this may be that he really did. This could be just a metaphor that his stress was so intense that it was like sweating great drops of blood. Or it could actually mean that he really did because of the stress, because there have been examples of people under such great stress that the blood capillaries pop. And so it mixes with the perspiration and comes out on the skin. 
what we can say for sure is, is that he was deeply, deeply perplexed and stressed. But yet he was willing to do what God had called him, his father had called him to do. And like our Lord, this is what he calls us to do. And so we struggle, don't we? And we must look to the Lord for help in this struggle that we might indeed obey and submit to his will in all things. We need his help to do that. And so we're instructed by Jesus to pray this very thing. But also this, it is indeed not just for us. When we pray this prayer, we're praying also that the will of God be done in all the earth, aren't we? Among all peoples of the earth, that the whole earth would reflect conformity to the will of God, that everyone on this planet would obey and submit to his will in all things. Of course, that's something to come. But I think one thing that's very helpful here to remember is, is that there is a unique connectedness in all of these statements of hallowing God's name, of, of, of uh, pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, that these are all connected in this way. These are all about God, aren't they? Every one of these petitions, these first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer are about God, not about us, about God. Yes, we're going to be asking for things in the next petition, beginning at the fourth petition. But before we even begin any other place in prayer, we begin with God himself. We begin with his holiness, his majesty, and his glory. We begin with the, the, the expansion of his kingdom, beginning in our own hearts, but throughout all the earth, through the kingdom of Christ, coming, becoming more real to people as Jesus, people come to Christ. And also, for his will to be done, John Calvin put it this way, there is a great affinity of likeness here among the petitions. Hallowing of God's name is always attached to his reign, and the chief feature of his reign is to be acknowledged in the doing of his will. I, uh, as I've been thinking about this whole thing that's going on in our, our culture right now, if there's one thing we clearly see, and I've mentioned it a few minutes ago, is that that uh, the will of God is not being done right now, is it, in the earth? And we long for it to be done like that as it is in heaven. And in the midst of it, that means we, as we long for this, we experience suffering in this world we experience trials and tribulations as the old writers would say we we experience the fallen world as it is and all that should do for us is make us long more and more and more for the realization of all these things that we're praying for in these first three petitions One of the things, beloved people of God, and if you're not a Christian, this is good for you to hear as well, but, but the path of our Lord Jesus Christ was a path of suffering. And before he receives his glory in the resurrection, triumphing over the evil one in the resurrection, be making a public spectacle to of those who are odds with Christ in his kingdom, um, he had to go through suffering. There was a cross before there was a crown. There was sorrow before there was joy. And that's the life of the Christian. This is why it is a struggle to live the Christian life for our lives to be more and more conformed to the will of God, that we would reflect what we were made to look like. It's a daily struggle, and so we suffer. And if we would share, Paul says, in the glories 
Christ, our elder brother, captain of our salvation, and we ourselves will need to go through the path of suffering also. But that we should not see that as a defeat, but a joy that we will be counted, even as the disciples did at one point. The apostles, as they suffered proclaiming the gospel, they counted it all joy that they might actually be able to suffer along with Christ. John Owen, this, uh, my friend Zach Groff, and I told him I would mention this last night, he has been working on a paper, at, he's at the seminary in Greenville, and uh, Zach uh, shared a quote that about 150 of us probably have reproduced since yesterday evening when he first posted it. It's a quote by John Owen, and it's about spiritual mindedness, and I think it's so wholly appropriate in terms of how we as a church approach what we see going on around us. How should we as Christians approach the coronavirus? How should we serve in the midst of such difficult times? Well, this is wisdom from the great Puritan, one of the best, my favorite Puritan writer, John Owen, when he says this, in every disaster, God is calling us to trust ourselves, our families, and all our enjoyments to his sovereign will and wisdom, so that we may be ready to part with all things when he calls, and that without any regrets. God is making wings for men's riches. He is shaking their homes. He is taking away all the visible differences of their lives. He is proclaiming the uncertainty and instability, instability of man's life. So the only thing Owen says that will give us rest and peace is to entrust everything to his sovereign will and pleasure. This is the way to mortify self and love for the world and the things that are of the world. Without this mortification, putting to death these things, we can never trust ourselves at all that we love and have to God's sovereign. <clears throat> will. And brothers and sisters, when we do that, we also find ourselves doing something else. Because that is, in first and foremost, that's in the deepest way, it's loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the net result of that is, is when we do love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will also love our neighbor as ourselves. We will seek their interest above our own. We will be like our Lord Jesus Christ who set aside his own glory for the sake of exalting us alongside himself, of raising up a people for himself, to bless a people for himself, to make a people for himself who will, who will shine for his glory, people who will experience everlasting joy, will reign with him forever in eternity. He would lay aside his own life for that purpose. He is the ultimate good neighbor. The perfect example of what a good neighbor is. He goes out of his way to lay down his life for his people. Would not we do the same if we are pursuing the will of God, seeking to bring the will of God to 